What you find in general is that weight training with heavy loads will increase testosterone levels up to 400%. So let's talk about competition because it turns out that competition is a powerful influence on the sex steroid hormones and the sex steroid hormones powerfully influence competition. Most males of a given mammalian species never get to reproduce. In fact, they never even get to have sex at all. And we don't often think about that, but testosterone plays a powerful role in determining which members of a given species will get to reproduce, which ones of that species will actually get access to females. Now, one interpretation of this is that the females are detecting which males have high testosterone and selecting them. They're more receptive to them. We're going to talk about receptivity for mating in a moment. But it's actually more so that the males that have higher testosterone forage further and will fight harder for the females. And this is really interesting because there's very good evidence now that testosterone can reduce anxiety, promote novelty seeking, and promote competitive interactions. So I've said before on previous versions of this podcast and on other podcasts that testosterone has this incredible effect of making effort feel good. But what I was really referring to is the fact that testosterone lowers stress and anxiety, in particular in males of a given species. And in doing so, it selects individuals of a given species to push further, being willing to you know, suffer more, um, although it also reduces pain, so maybe they also suffer less, in pursuit of reproduction in females. But it's also true that competition itself can increase androgens such as testosterone. Now, some people have come to the conclusion that if you win, your testosterone goes up, and if you lose, your testosterone goes down. And to some extent, that's true, but that's not a direct effect on the gonads. That's actually mediated by the neuromodulator dopamine. Dopamine is actually released in the brain in ways that has the pituitary, this gland that sits over the roof of your mouth, release certain hormones that then go on to promote the release of more testosterone. And indeed, winning promotes more dopamine and later more testosterone. However, in the short term, just competing increases testosterone independent of whether or not you win or lose. So testosterone promotes sex-seeking behavior. And the real question then is, does sex itself promote testosterone? And the answer is somewhat complicated, but the short version is yes, because whether or not sex itself increases testosterone depends on whether or not the male ejaculates. So there are studies showing that sexual behavior itself can increase testosterone. When people participated in sex, they actually did this study where people had blood draws and they had real sex with their partners and they had 70% increases in testosterone. Now, the question that I often get is whether or not ejaculation adjusts testosterone levels. And it turns out that sex and ejaculation itself does not reduce testosterone levels. However, abstinence or sex without ejaculation for a week or more will increase testosterone levels up to 400%. One of the main behaviors that's been shown to be associated with lower levels of testosterone is apnea. Apnea has everything to do with underbreathing and the buildup of too much carbon dioxide in the body. People who are dramatically overweight also suffer a lot from apnea during sleep. There's actually a lot of buildup of carbon dioxide in the body, and that can lead to excessive sleepiness during the day, inability to access the deeper phases of sleep. And it's well established that going into deep sleep and getting the proper patterns of slow wave sleep and REM sleep are important for hormone optimization. There's now a lot of literature showing that breathing through the nose, not through the mouth, is powerful for improving lots of things. First of all, it improves cosmetic features of the jaw and face. There's also a lot of data and studies described in this book, Jaws, that describe how nose breathing in wakefulness and in sleep promotes all sorts of positive things related to not just cosmetics, but also the improvement of gas exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the body. And as well, it can modify levels of different neurotransmitters and neuromodulators in ways that positively can impact hormones. So believe it or not, 
being a nasal breather and avoiding being a mouth breather can actually positively impact hormones and in particular the hormones testosterone and estrogen. So that's the first piece of behavioral advice. The second piece of behavioral advice relates to the viewing of light. Viewing bright light within the first hour of waking, whether or not it's from artificial light or ideally from sunlight, has these powerful effects on sleep and wakefulness because hormones, light and dopamine have a very close knit relationship. So much so that your light viewing behavior can actually have a direct effect on hormone levels and fertility. It can have a direct effect on hormone levels and libido. It can have a direct effect on hormone levels and your ability to heal quickly. This translates to the protocol of if you want to optimize testosterone and estrogen, you need to get your light viewing behavior correct. It's not just about optimizing your sleep, which is also important. It's about getting sufficient amount of light in your eyes so you have sufficient levels of dopamine. So the simple protocols for that I've reviewed before, but it means getting anywhere from two to 10 minutes of bright light exposure in your eyes early in the day. The other aspect of light viewing behavior that's extremely important is to avoid bright light exposure to your eyes in the middle of the night. If you're viewing bright light in the middle of the night, you are suppressing dopamine release. If you're suppressing dopamine release, you are suppressing testosterone levels. So much so that I would wager that a major effect of sleep deprivation on reducing testosterone and estrogen is not necessarily because of the lack of sleep per se. It's because usually when people are not getting enough sleep, they're getting too much light in their eyes in the middle of the night as well. Let's talk about a third element that can actually have some pretty profound influences on hormone levels, and that's heat and cold. So nowadays, there's a lot of interest in using cold as a way to stimulate testosterone. Believe it or not, ice baths and cold showers can have positive effects on the sex steroid hormones, both testosterone, mainly in males, and estrogen, mainly in females. What happens is there's a rebound in vasodilation after cooling. So cooling causes vasoconstriction. And then after the cooling, there's a rebound vasodilation and there's more infusion of blood into the gonads. And then when the gonad and the surrounding area heats up again, you're getting a rebound hypervasodilation that delivers excessive levels of uh, not excessive, but increased levels of GnRH and other hormones and carriers and carrier proteins and so forth that would then stimulate the gonad to release more testosterone. So now let's talk about how exercise in its various forms, weight training, endurance work, weight training to failure, or less intense weight training can impact testosterone levels. So what's interesting is when you start digging into the more mechanistic studies, what you find in general is that Weight training with heavy loads, so anywhere from one rep maximum to somewhere in the you know, six to eight rep repetition range in males or females, increases testosterone significantly. There's clearly a influence of hard work at the neural level and then at the muscular level for increasing testosterone. And there's also clearly an effect of working too hard and presumably increasing cortisol too much although I'm speculating there, in terms of reducing testosterone. But this basically boils down to a particular set of protocols where if you want to increase testosterone for whatever reason, that weight training with heavy loads, but not to failure seems to be the best supported, at least scientifically supported solution to that. 